I'm Max Tegmark, and it's a great honor to welcome you all to the 2020 Future of Life Awards, where we're going to celebrate two amazing people who've helped save about 200 million lives. And to help us celebrate, we're going to hear from a bunch of fascinating people, from Bill Gates, we're going to, we're going to hear from Anthony Fauci, Jennifer Doudna. This award that we're giving out, you might think, what's another award? There are so many awards. You can win the Oscars for making great movies. You can win medals for running really fast. You can win Nobel Prizes for doing great science. And in fact, we have someone who has done just that yesterday, who's with us today. Uh, why do we need another one? Well, we feel that there should also be a, an award for those unsung heroes who have done incredibly great things for humanity that many people haven't heard of or are much less famous than your average Hollywood actor. To give you a flavor of this, let me tell you who's won so far. In 2017, the Future of Life Award went to Vasily Arkhipov, who single-handedly prevented a Soviet nuclear, nuclear attack on US forces. And we're so honored to have his very own daughter, Yelena, with us live today from Moscow. Privet, Yelena, and a warm welcome to you. If it weren't for your father, he probably would not be here. That was a tough act to follow, but the following year, Stanislav Petrov got the Future Life Award for helping avert another nuclear war in 1983, when the Soviet early warning center that he was in charge of saw five incoming American nuclear missiles. And uh, we're very grateful that he was the guy in charge that day. The following year, the award went to Professor Matthew Messelson, just down the road from where I am here at MIT, down at Harvard, for his incredible contributions to uh, getting biological weapons banned and for avoiding a, an arms race in bioweapons. And this is why today we think of biology as a force for good for developing COVID vaccines and for saving lives rather than for taking lives. Many of my friends got really worried about this and said, hey, you've set impossible standards for the Future of Life Award. This is just an impossible act to follow. But I'm really delighted that today we are going to prove them wrong by introducing you to two other truly, truly worthy winners. So let's roll the video. Imagine how you'd react to the headline, mutated coronavirus discovered, killing 30% of those infected. Smallpox was such a lethal virus, estimated to have killed 500 million people in its last century. But a massive international team effort defeated smallpox, completely eradicating it. And UNICEF estimates that this has saved close to 200 million lives so far. Today, to celebrate the 41st anniversary of the official eradication of smallpox, we grant the Future of Life Award to two heroes who critically contributed to this victory, Bill Fagy and Viktor Zhdanov. Viktor Zhdanov has been called the best person who ever lived by Oxford professor Will McCaskill for successfully persuading the World Health Organization to initiate an eradication campaign where the United States and the Soviet Union teamed up despite the Cold War. While serving as the Soviet Union's Deputy Minister of Health, Viktor Zhdanov persuaded naysayers both at home and abroad that the world could and should eradicate smallpox with a united effort and arranged for the Soviet Union to donate 25 million doses of smallpox vaccine to kickstart the effort in developing countries. The World Health Organization accepted his proposal in 1959, and he lived to see smallpox officially eradicated in 1979. He passed away in 1987, and his award will be received by his sons, Viktor Zhdanov and Michael Bukrinsky, in his memory. Eradicating smallpox required not only audacity, but also solving the problem of insufficient resources for vaccinating everyone. 
While working for the Center of Disease Control in Africa as chief of the smallpox eradication program, Bill Fakey developed a highly successful surveillance and ring vaccination strategy, which has been described as applying water to the house on fire rather than the whole neighborhood. This greatly reduced the number of vaccinations needed, ensuring that the limited resources available sufficed to make smallpox, the first infectious disease, to be eradicated in human history. Bill Fagey and Viktor Zdanov are true heroes who remind us of the power of science and international collaboration for tackling COVID-19 and future health challenges. Thank you both. Yes, thank you both. I'm tearing up here because it's so moving what, what you have accomplished. If there were a Nobel Prize for saving lives, you would both have won it. And, and so would Vasily Arkhipov, Stanley, Stanislav Petrov and, and Matthew Meselson. And if it were not for the collective acts of all of you, I would probably not be alive right now. And the same probably goes for most of you listening to this. So it's a really great honor to get to bestow the Future Life Award today to Dr. Bill Fagey and Dr. Viktor Zhdanov. Thanks to the amazing generosity of Jan Tallinn, one of the founders of the Future Life Institute, you will be sharing $100,000. And also, it is my great honor to give you something personal right now to hold on to. So it's a great honor for me to first of all give the 2020 Future of Life Award to Dr. Bill Fagey. See, a little MIT particle transmutator through space time it worked. <laughs> Congratulations. Can you unmute Bill Fagey, dear producers? Or maybe yeah, we're on it. We got it. Congratulations. So thank you, Max, for the honor, for the plaque, and for the exceptional science that allowed you to transmit this to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our pleasure. And it is similarly enormous honor to give the Future Life Award to the late Viktor Zhdanov. And we're so delighted to have you here. Dr. Michael Buklinski to receive this plaque. Ooh. Oh, this one went instead. It's, it's hard to pull it off the internet, actually. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, Max, and it's a great honor. Wonderful. And, we, and finally, the third plaque. It's a great honor to, get, to give it to, to be, give this to Dr. Viktor Zhdanov, Jr. Amazing what some quantum teleportation can do. Congratulations, all. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very proud of it. Thank you. And we are very proud. Max, we uh, lost your audio. Max, we lost your audio. Uh, go ahead and speak again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. All right. So congratulations again. We now turn to celebrating our winners. And first, let's hear from Bill Gates. I'm sorry I can't be with you to honor two true heroes of global health, Viktor Zodanov and Bill Fahey with the Future of Life Award. They're phenomenal examples of what it means to harness science for public health. The eradication of smallpox not only prevented unnecessary suffering and death, it showed the world that diseases can be defeated. And it reminds us of the need for global cooperation in fighting other diseases such as COVID-19, malaria, polio, and diseases we have yet to encounter. I've never had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Zdanov, but the more I learn about his accomplishments, the more I respect his work. He played a leading role in getting rival superpowers to team up against smallpox. 
I do have the pleasure of knowing Bill Fahey. It's fair to say he was my first teacher in global health. Bill was one of the first people Melinda and I turned to when we began learning about the subject. And he's had a huge influence on us. We wanted to understand what it took to eradicate diseases. So we turned to one of the people who had actually done it. He gave me a list of about 80 books and journals to read and I looked at all of them. One important thing I learned from that assignment was how much more I needed to learn. Luckily, Bill has been there as helping us every step of the way, also sharing his knowledge, wisdom, and passion. He also has more memorable quotes from ancient writers than any other person I know. Bill has set a phenomenal example for everyone who cares about global health as a physician, teacher, leader, and advocate for acting on the idea that all lives have equal value. Congratulations again to Bill and to the family of Dr. Sadonov. And thank you all for your continuing efforts to save lives around the world. Yes, thank you from all of us. And to continue the, the celebrations, uh, we're now gonna to turn to a, a fun discussion with uh, Dr. Jennifer Doudna and Dr. Anthony Fauci. And uh, first of all, is it okay if I call it to you simply Jennifer and Tony? Good, good. So my first question to you, Jennifer, is what was in, how did you guys pull off the, the Nobel Prize ceremony yesterday without uh, upsetting um, Tony with poor social distancing? Well, it went through a few different planning stages and ended up happening outdoors on my patio in Berkeley, California. And uh, uh, I think uh, everybody here would be pleased to know that it was a, a lovely event, very small, very safe, everybody masked and distanced, but uh, still really meaningful, I think, to all of us as a celebration of science. So we're all looking nervously at you, Tony. Uh, do you approve? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, given the circumstances in which the world is right now, um, the kind of honor that was given to Jennifer for her extraordinary scientific accomplishment could not be put off. So in the spirit of improvisation, what they did was to do it in a way that was totally safe, but nonetheless extraordinarily meaningful. So she gets an A plus for public health. Wonderful. Huge congratulations to you, Jennifer, not only on winning the Nobel Prize, that was the easy part, but for getting an A-plus from Tony Fauci. <laughs> so let me first ask each of you, maybe you can, you can start, Jennifer, if there's anything you want, any congratulations that you want to pass along to the winners. Well, I, I, certainly, uh, I certainly am in awe of your work. It's extraordinary. I think that you know the the example of the smallpox eradication effort is one that we all look to as a, a model for what can be achieved in in global public health. It's truly amazing, and boy, it couldn't be more relevant this year in 2020 when we find ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic, and I hope on the verge of eradicating that virus that's causing it, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, with emerging vaccines. And I hope we get into a little bit of a discussion about that because I think it's a, it's a really exciting opportunity we have in front of us, but also a really big challenge. Great. So what about you, Tony? Do you wanna, <clears throat> is there anything particular you wanna convey to the, to the winners or about them? Yeah, well, thank you, Max. Well. You know, as a person who's been involved in infectious diseases now for for several decades, um, I, I'm just thrilled to be here uh, with you today to pay honor to Victor and and Bill. Um, I never met uh, Dr. Zanoff, but um, Bill Fagi has been a friend and an inspiration not only to me, but to virtually every other public health official who has tackled any serious problem. He's become, together with Victor, the gold standards of what is achievable. I mean, 
the, the massive undertaking of taking one of the most devastating diseases in the history of civilization and not only controlling it, not only eliminating it, but actually eradicating it is really stands as the standard, as Jennifer said, of what we hope to do with other diseases, with polio, with measles, and ultimately, I hope, with SARS coronavirus too. So you set a high standard and hopefully some of us will meet it in the future. Wonderful. So one big question I have here is reflecting on this triumph, aside from celebrating it is, what is it that we can learn from it? What lessons did, can we draw from these great successes, both the political ones of, of Viktor Zhdanov and getting all this international collaboration going between rivaling superpowers to, to do better global health and also on the scientific side and in terms of the management, what lessons are there that are relevant today? For, for example, uh, Tony, are there anything, any lessons here that you, you feel are relevant to uh, fighting COVID? Well, yes, Max, you alluded a, a bit to, to a, a couple of them. I think one of the most important is when you're dealing with a global health challenge, you've got to attack it at a global level. And what Bill and what Victor did was to really establish that there are no boundaries. There are the globe that we live on. Smallpox was a disease that afflicted society. They teamed up in what appeared at the time to be divisive and competing superpowers. There's no secret that we live in a divisive world right now. We live even in the country in which we're all sitting right now, at least some of us in the United States is very divisive. And we're dealing with one of the most historic outbreaks that have occurred in the last hundred years dating back to 1918. So there are many lessons to be learned that as enormous as the problem is, you can encounter it and you can overcome it the way Bill and Victor did, despite the fact that politically you were in very problematic circumstances. So I think it's almost eerily similar when you talk about the differences of what we're doing now and what Bill and Victor did decades ago. Yeah, um, feel free to chime in, uh, you too, Bill, and uh, you too, Michael, if, if you have reflections on this, of what, what, we should, what we should learn from, from this, if there's anything. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, Victor was never awarded uh, any kind of uh, prize or anything in the Soviet Union for his accomplishments in, uh, uh, in uh, eradicating smallpox. That's amazing. And uh, the reason probably was that uh, uh, smallpox at that time was not uh, uh, such a you know, major uh, medical problem in, in Soviet Union. Uh, it was a problem in, uh, in underdeveloped world. And that's, that even makes it, uh, in my view, uh, even more kind of significant that Victor at that time uh, spent all his efforts and uh, his, uh, this was actually his lifelong efforts to engage international scientific uh, cooperation to uh, fight this uh, you know, problem uh, around the world. I'm so delighted also to have so many participants from around the world making this a very international celebration right now. And, and what we just heard there about really collaborating internationally and including the developing world, that sounds very much like you, Bill, like what you spent so much of your work doing. Do you want to comment on, on any of, of the lessons learned as well in your mind? Thank you, Max. First, uh, Jennifer, congratulations to you. And it was a pleasure to have Bill Gates make his statement because I've said this many times, when the history of global health is finally written, we'll find that the year 2000 was a tipping point. And it was because of the Gates family getting involved in global health. 
And Tony, thank you so much for uh, being here. A friend of yours asked me if I would find out what you've been doing this last year. And so maybe we could talk about that later. But in the meantime, let me just say that Tony has turned out to be the ultimate scientist. Huxley once said that science is simply common sense at its best. And Tony has provided that every day, that common sense at its best, even when there's a lot of uh, noise around this, untruths going around and, and so forth. The, the other thing I'd like to say about Tony, if I recall correctly, Tony, you were driving to your first day as an infectious disease resident when you heard on the radio the Surgeon General of the United States declaring the end of infectious diseases. And you wonder, what in the world am I doing? <laughs> it shows you the, the problem with the predictions. But the, the question of, of what have we learned? I think one of the single biggest lessons that I learned is that if you're going to do not only the eradication of disease, but any scientific endeavor, there are three things that have to come together. One is the science. And people outside of science think we really know what's happening. But uh, I'm reminded of the fact that Richard Feynman said uncertainty is the basis of science. He said, in fact, certainty is the Achilles heel of science. And people see science as being truth, but it's actually just a way of finding, getting as close to certainty and as close to truth as we can. And then when you look at the Huxley quote of that it's common sense that it's best, that's one of the three things that one has to uh, to think about. Second, uh, Will Durant said, if you add art to science, you now bring creativity into this. So you have creative common sense at its best. And he used as his example, Imhotep, the Egyptian physician, who was also an artist, who designed and built the step pyramid. And then for the third part of this, uh, I go back to Roger Bacon 700 years ago, who did a report for the Pope. And he came out with three summary statements, but one of them was, science has no moral compass. Therefore, you need scientists with a moral compass. And if you put this all together, you're talking about creative, moral, common sense at its best. And that's a great foundation for any science endeavor. And that seems like a wonderful description of both uh, Victor Stanov and Bill Fagy also that goes like a red thread throughout their work. I've very much enjoyed reading, uh, reading Bill's book, which I would highly recommend anyone who wants to learn more about smallpox eradication, House on Fire. And um, where well, you can see all these three things. And uh, there is also a book that has never been published in the English language about uh, Viktor Zhdanov, which was written by his late wife. So to help honor him, we have had it translated now into English for the very first time. And on the award website, we're putting it there as a free PDF download. It's absolutely fi fascinating reading where I think, again, th those very three traits that you just mentioned there shine through loud and clear as, as we'll, we'll continue talking about later today. At a personal level, also, I, I almost teared up here when you talked about how, how the foundation of science is not certainty, but uncertainty because, and quoted my great physics hero, Richard Feynman, because when people ask me sometimes to define science, to me, it's all about embracing uncertainty. I, I, to me, being a scientist really means that I would rather have questions I can't answer than answers I can't question. And um, <laughs> so the, uh, in, before we move on from, from this question about what lessons we learned, let me throw it out to all four of you again, uh, Jennifer, Tony, Michael, Bill, to see if there's anything more you, you would like to add on this fascinating topic. There are two things, Max, that I would add. I think the second, lesson is the lesson of tenacity. Uh, tenacity doesn't always win, but it's the only thing that does win. And when you think of Victor 
coming up with his idea in 1958, which was presented in Minneapolis. Now, most World Health Assemblies are held in Geneva, but this one was held in Minneapolis. So he was doing it on US ground, proposing a smallpox eradication program. And he did that every year at the World Health Assembly until finally he was agreed to put some money into it. So tenacity is very important. The third lesson though would be to actually learn the lessons because I see Tony every day, not only fighting coronavirus, but fighting people who are not observing the lessons of the past. What we've learned, which you need to know the truth. You need coalitions, you need a national plan. You need to work globally. And so Tony's been up against both a virus and some misconceptions on how to proceed with the program. So it's a double task for him. So Tony, let me ask you what <laughs> lessons we should learn from you. Then what is your secret? How do you manage to stay so true to these ideals of, of common sense, compassionate science, despite all sorts of, of, of pressures from all directions? <laughs> what can you teach the rest of us? Well, I think it was just mentioned a little bit ago. Uh, what I try to do is focus like a laser beam on what my purpose and what my end game is. And that is right now in the middle of an outbreak, um, the health and the safety of the American people driven by evidence-based science. I mean, just what we've been talking about here today, that science leads us to the development of policies that are directed to the preservation of the health and the safety of the American public. Everything else, Max, is noise. And you've got to take it for what it is. It's distracting noise. Once you get caught up in the distracting noise, you get diverted and distracted from what your main goal is. So you've got to be able to focus and just say to yourself, you know, sometimes this is offensive and you want to hit back. And sometimes somebody's insulting you and saying that you're crazy. Just put it aside and focus and stay with the science. And actually, it's not that complicated to do because it's pretty clear when you see data and truth that we're talking about today that leads you to the development of policies. You make it sound so easy, Tony, but we all know <laughs> that it's actually very hard to not get distracted by the noise, especially when it's personal ad hominem and really, really, really distracting noise. Do you have any personal techniques you can recommend to the rest of us for just doing what you actually said and retaining focus nonetheless? Well, I go back to one of my favorite movies, The Godfather Part One, <laughs> where they said, it's nothing personal, it's strictly business. <laughs> so, don't, so don't take it personal. <laughs> I have learned something great today, Tony. Thank you so much for that. But, but it's still, Max, it's worth mentioning that Tony was able to remain a public servant while many people then became private servants. They started out as public servants, but they could not withstand the pressure and they became private servants. And we were all very grateful for that. So, so let us uh, shift gears now from reflecting on lessons from the past to talking about the future. To me, one thing that stands out about the smallpox eradication, aside from the fact that it's already, according to estimates, saved about 200 million lives and continues saving lives every year when it passes without any deaths. Uh, aside from the sheer goodness of it, Another thing that really stands out is the sheer audacity of it. Right? That's why it was so remarkable, for example, that, that Viktor Zhdanov was able to nonetheless sell this and persuade people to try for this ultimate moonshot. And even both the audacity of the science of eradicating this horrible disease and the audacity of thinking that you could get the Soviet Union and the United States to work together on something during the Cold War. So, I'm, my question for the future, looking to the future is, can we also be, in, if we get inspired by this audacity, 
what other truly audacious public health goals for public health, for medical science are there out there now that you would like us to see take on? Uh, let me start maybe with you, Jennifer. Well, I certainly think, you know, going back to the example of the, the uh, smallpox eradication, the goal of, of um, vaccinating the world against the coronavirus is a, a big one and an immediate one that we're facing. And I do think that there's a, there's a big challenge ahead, but it's also a, an incredible opportunity. And it's an opportunity not only in global public health, but also in education and, and uh, kind of furthering the you know, the uh, view that I think many of us uh, here certainly would share, which is, was articulated beautifully by uh, Tony Fauci that, you know, that, that uh, you know, science, it, you know, is, uh, you know, we need to rely on evidence-based science as we make public health decisions, not on, not on speculation or fears or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, various, various kinds of uh, made up uh, imagined, imagined uh, stories, but, but really on the, ev the best evidence that we have right now for a circumstance we find ourselves in, such as this pandemic. So I th certainly think that's, that's an immediate goal. And then beyond that, um, you know, I, I personally think that uh, we're facing a, a, another, I think, equally important, uh, you know, or, or equally global emergency, if you think about the challenge we face with, with uh, climate change. And I, you know, you might say, well, wait a minute, does that, what, what does that have to do with medicine or public health? I think it has everything to do with it. And uh, I'd really like to see all of us as scientists uh, think about how we're going to address this and uh, use our, our expertise and our work to do what we can to uh, deal with, I think, what is, is truly an existential threat to, to all of us. Those are very good points. Smallpox did not respect borders. Carbon dioxide also blows right across borders. Nuclear winter doesn't respect borders. So many of these great challenges uh, are truly global challenges and, and taking them on, we, we, can, we can be inspired by this audacity that we've seen in uh, today's guest of honor here, Bill Fage and, and, and Victor Zdanov. Tony, what about you? If you were to pick out a few moonshots, they're truly audacious that you would like us to, to take on, ideally, again, as global collaborations. W what's on your top list? You know, Max, there are a couple. There, there are finishing um, things that have been started that are still doable. I'm very frustrated as an infectious disease person that we have not yet eradicated two diseases that are eminently eradicatable. And that is polio. We were almost there, almost. And then we slipped a bit as a, as a global community. Mm -hmm. But I think we can get back on track and do polio. The other is the common disease of measles. You know, um, I learned from Bill many years ago from things he's written that there's control, there's elimination, and there's eradication. You know, and we've controlled and eliminated to many respects measles, for example, in many of the developing countries, but we have not yet eradicated it, but it is eminently eradicatable. And I think we need to continue to not give up on that effort. So those are two of the things that I think we need to aim at. The other is something that is also, you know, audacious and bold, but it's something we should not um, uh, give up on is that to have throughout the world health systems that are achievable and available to everyone throughout the world. I mean, if we could build up local global health systems so that people in developing countries do not suffer and in some cases die from diseases that are so easily taken care of in the developed world. I, you know, I just have felt always that we have a moral responsibility, those of us who live in rich countries, to share that wealth in the sense of providing for developing countries some of the things that's impossible for them to do on their own. 
you don't want to make welfare states of everyone, but you got to help people to do things that they can't do on their own. So those are three things that I think we can look forward to in the coming decades. That's very inspiring. The thing you said there about helping the developing world, of course, also is a, is a great way to celebrate the Victor Stanov and Bill Fagy, because of course the rich countries had already been vaccinating their populations for quite a while. And it was the, the final amazing push was precisely to help the rest of the world get up to that same level. And maybe maybe you, if, if you could also just say a couple of words to help those who are listening here understand why it was, even though people who are listening, they've heard of so many diseases and they might wonder why are you picking just measles and polio? Do you want to say something about the human only transmission? Yeah. All right. Well, that's a very good point, Mac. Max. There are certain characteristics that you have to have uh, if you want to eradicate uh, an infectious disease from the planet. And if it has an, a reservoir in another species, it becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do, which is one of the reasons why a disease like Ebola may be very difficult to do because there are reservoirs all over the place with Ebola, particularly in Central, in Central Africa. The other thing is the ingredient that you have a highly efficacious and effective vaccine. And that's what we have for both of them. The measles vaccine is the gold standard of efficacy. It's about 98% effective. You achieve herd immunity by getting 90% or more of the population vaccinated. Once you do that, measles will disappear. And the same holds true for polio. Thank you so much. Let me ask uh, also you, Michael, and uh, you, Bill. If, Michael, do you have any, any moonshots, any really audacious things you, you would like to see? Yeah, I, I actually wanted to ask Tony uh, about, uh, about uh, coronavirus because he mentioned that uh, lack of uh, animal reservoir for those uh, polio and, um, and uh, measles. Uh, is a kind of uh, factor that allows elimination. But what about uh, coronavirus, which has a very wide uh, reservoir, animal reservoir? Uh, can we eliminate that one? I think, Michael, that we can for the following reason, that I believe, given what we know of the commonality of spike proteins, which are the major antigen or immunogen in the vaccine for coronaviruses, that it is attainable for us to develop what we call a universal coronavirus vaccine, namely a vaccine that is not only effective against the common cold coronaviruses, of which there are four, effective against the three known pandemic coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, and now SARS coronavirus 2, but any coronavirus that might actually emerge in the future because there is a large bat reservoir for coronaviruses. But if you can vaccinate the world with a universal coronavirus vaccine, you could even prevent it ever from becoming a public health hazard. Thank you. Michael, you are a very successful researcher yourself on HIV. So do you think there might be any hope one day of also making HIV extinct? Um, yeah, I was actually waiting for Tony to, to mention it, but uh, he didn't. And uh, uh, I agree that that may be a long shot, that it's really a very uh, difficult uh, task, uh, simply because HIV is a chronic disease. It's kind of, it's very difficult to, but I believe that uh, if we um, if we kind of uh, use the technology uh, and in particular this uh, Jennifer's uh, kind of CRISPR uh, uh, based uh, 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 technology to uh, which would allow us to really eliminate the virus from the from the infected people and uh, uh, eventually I think uh, it's it would be possible to uh, to uh, get uh, this uh, infection from the human population. Of course, this virus again, it, it, it exists in, in animals and in, in, in monkeys. 
So, but uh, but uh, maybe uh, at some day we will have a vaccine that again would to prevent uh, transmission and infection. So I I I I think that uh, HIV uh, can can be added to this future kind of hopes uh, of. Uh, Elimination of infectious disease. Wonderful. In, in about one minute, uh, we're going to do uh, what in soccer is called a substitution. We're going to let Anthony Fauci go off and <laughs> continue helping us with you know what and replace him with another awesome panelist. But I, I want to first give you a chance, Anthony, to get the last word in this segment here. Is there anything more you want to add? Uh, yes, I, I, I want to just express my appreciation for giving me the opportunity to participate uh, over this uh, hour, 45 minutes with two extraordinary heroes um, in, a, uh, in an arena in which I work every single day. I mean, it, it, there's something about having heroes that you can look up to. And certainly, uh, Victor and Bill are two of those individuals also to have the opportunity to be on the panel with, with Jennifer and to congratulate her again on an extraordinary accomplishment for which she was so deservedly awarded the Nobel Prize yesterday. Well, thank you. Uh, and as you heard, you yourself are of course also a hero who's inspired so many here. So thank you so much and, and uh, keep doing what, <laughs> what you do so well and don't let all the noise get to you. <laughs> thank you very thank much. Thank you so man. much, Tony, it's been a real pleasure. Bye -bye. And now we will welcome to this conversation none other than uh, Professor Matthew Messelson from Harvard University, last year's Future Life Award winner. Who, as as I'm, hey Matthew, so great to see you. I think you, you need to unmute yourself there. And uh, if I'm half as energetic at sixty, yeah. you are. You know? I'll be I'll be really delighted. It's a, such a pleasure to have you with us. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Very so good. I should explain why I'm wearing this mask. It's because dentistry has caused a very temporary hematoma, which I don't want you to have to suffer to see. Otherwise, it's a trivial thing, but I do need to wear the mask to protect you. There is something I would like to say. I don't know if this is the right time, Max. I don't want to intrude on other things. Oh, no, please do. Please do. All right. So there's certainly justifiable concern for what are called existential threats that involve mass destruction of environment or of human life. And also for threats that uh, might occur in the near future. But it's very difficult to think productively about things that might happen in the distant future or things that happen or accrue only very gradually. We all know that we're evolved to deal with imminent threats, uh, but not to deal very well with long-term threats. So the thing I want to mention is that not only is it important to protect human life, what you are celebrating today, but it's also important to think about, because I don't know how to do it yet, to protect what it means to be human, what it means to be, in other words, to protect our humanity. One could imagine that our species in some evolved form, because evolution is not stopping, it's proceeding, that some manifestation of our species or a species that might in a long period of time branch off from it, would be thriving, very healthy, in a very nice environment, but would have lost some of the attributes that we value most. How do you deal with this kind of a question? I hardly know. One of the things would be first to just discuss, and particularly with students, because they're the people who will be in positions to influence the dialogue of the future and decisions of the future, to discuss what do we value most? in humanity? Is it curiosity? Is it kindness? Is it compassion? Is it the ability to sit down purely with mathematical concepts, develop them, and then find out, to everyone's astonishment, that they tell you 
what the physical world is like. That's what Einstein, as just one example, did. He sat down and worked with what are called tensors and other mathematical formulations, following the rules of the math, and got general relativity. And now we detect uh, signals from gravitational waves caused by black holes colliding. So what? Uh, maybe there are other things. So I know, I, uh, however, I am worried about one thing. And this is in Jennifer's province, of course. And that is not today, not tomorrow, not in any of our lifetimes, but if it ever becomes common practice to manipulate the human genome, which I'm sure will happen, I hope that when it does happen, we know enough about something with regard to which we know nothing now, which is what is it inside of this box that makes us human? Yeah, thank you so much for this perfect, perfect uh, pivot. Now, I want to say one more thing yeah. about that. And that is that I know enough about this to know that off-target effects are not going to be a serious problem. That can be dealt with. I am concerned, and this is directed to Jennifer, with epistatic interactions, because we know almost nothing about, I don't want to get too technical here. I've written about it. But we know almost nothing about how the product of one gene interacts with the products of other genes. So that in modifying the product of one gene, in ignorance of how it might interact with other genes, which is called epistasis, uh, who knows exactly what kind of deep waters might give you to. So there needs to be more study of the humanities, more asking what makes us human. Eventually we'll know up here. It's all up here. It's got to be there. So that uh, not only modification of the human genome, but also possibly if we, uh, if, we if we entrust too much of our humanity to machines, I mean advanced intelligent machines, if we do too much entrusting, I would call it entrusting because in principle we should always have the ability to yeah. pull it back, but that too might have long-term effects on what it means to be human. Yeah, Matthew, let me jump in here, Matthew, and, and thank you so much again for, for segueing into exactly what we want to focus the remainder of this conversation on. And before we, we hear from epi about epistatic interactions from, from Jennifer and so on, just to frame this at the higher level, what we want to focus on is exactly this, looking farther into the future now, biotechnology and so on will obviously continue growing ever more powerful. How can we steer it in a good direction towards great uses like eradicating smallpox and the other diseases that we heard about earlier and away from bad uses, such as the humanity. Biological, let me just finish the here. The humanity. Like the biological weapons that you helped us get banned um, and, and, and other things. So I wanted to first, first ask you here, Jennifer, so you, you in terms of this steering challenge, you know, you wrote this very interesting piece in The Economist recently where you actually made some quite concrete proposals for, for what we should do. Do you want to do you want to share a little bit about that with the rest of us? Well, I, I certainly agree with what Matt Meselson just articulated. We absolutely need to be thinking about how to integrate science with a broader perspective on what it means to be human. And how do we do that? It's a big challenge. Um, I personally think that it has to involve uh, all of us uh, who are practicing scientists being a lot more engaged than we maybe have been in the past in these conversations. And, um, you know, I saw an interesting Twitter thread this morning that reflected, I think, what many people, unfortunately, uh, think of, of scientists, which is not flattering. And uh, you know they think about scientists as uh, people who are are uh, a bit smug, maybe a bit um, you know self-involved, and and not inclusive in our views of the world and our our incorporation of other you know other sort of non uh, non scientists in thinking about the future of science and technology. So I'd really like to see that become a much more commonplace thing. I think it was true in the, in the past, historically, that science was far more integrated into 
society and you know dinner table conversations than maybe it is now. And so yeah. I think we all have a part to play there. And uh, and I think also as Matt Meselson said, I agree that it has to it has to be the uh, the focus of our our students. Uh, they are the future, and they're the future of everything. And so we really need to encourage our students to be more inclusive in their thinking rather than getting too siloed in particular areas of science, thinking about it in a more integrated way. And it, it is a big challenge, but I think that's something that honestly, the Future of Life Institute is well positioned to do. Thank you for that. Yeah, this is of course the whole reason we, we created the Future of Life Institute because we love technology, but technology is not good. It's also not evil. It's a tool. And we want to work to steer it towards good uses, like eradicating smallpox and away from the ones that you, Matthew, have worked so hard to, to put the kibosh on. And I want to just give a shout out here to Viktor Zdanov himself also, because the book that has never been read in English before that we had translated and is on the website now, my wife and I had a lot of fun reading it just over the past few nights here. And it was so touching to see that the, he was very much a Soviet version of Matthew Meselson. In, in, 1960, in 1968, he spent two months learning Spanish just so he could go to a conference in Mexico and give a speech in Spanish about why we should ban bioweapons. <laughs> it was really remarkable. And, uh, in, uh, and then much, much later, he, when he discovered to his horror, you can read about this again in this book, which we can download for free, that his a deputy in his institute that he ran had secretly been developing bioweapons behind his back. He immediately fired him and made a big stink about it. And uh, uh, he, he, this was clearly something he was very, very, very uh, passionate about. I want to ask you, Bill, a little bit also the same question. If you think about the future, all the great things that we can do with biology and biotech and the things we should avoid. What are the things you feel most strongly we have to be careful to avoid? And do you have any, any recommendations for how, how we can um, keep our moral compass working? Thank you, Max. First, I would repeat some of the things that we heard. I think the biggest problems that we face are problems that would lead to the extinction of humans. And there are three or four big ones we've heard a little bit about each one, but global warming is one. Nuclear weapons is a second one. Artificial intelligence, I think, is a third one. And I think synthetic biology is a fourth one. So we should be putting a lot of attention on the things that could actually cause the extinction of humans. A second area that I would think about is this area that Tony brought up of equity and uh, Toynbee, the historian, said the 20th century will be remembered for the time when we got equity in health around the world. He was absolutely wrong. We ended the century with such a gap. But I think we now have tools. We have the ability to narrow that gap. So equity in various things, health would be one, education would be another, the ability for people to thrive. Uh, so that's an area. And then I would go to the third area that uh, Tony was talking about. There are specific diseases that we could eliminate right now. And I agree with him that uh, polio and, uh, and measles are two of them. A guinea worm is close to eradication, but without a vaccine. So we shouldn't limit eradication to infectious diseases. I think we should be thinking about chemicals and other things that are harmful and how would we eradicate them. I think the future in this is very difficult because of what we call asymmetry, that it's possible for a person or a small group of people to actually hold an entire country or the entire world at hostage with their science and technology. And so on the one hand, I think continue to reward people who are using science and technology correctly. And then we need a real surveillance system to detect when people are doing something that could cause great harm to, to lots of people. 
But I take some comfort from how we see this happening in crime. It's very difficult for people to do certain things now without being filmed. And, uh, so I think we're getting better at surveillance, but we're not perfect in surveillance. But to reward the people that are doing it right is something we should continue doing. And that's, of course, what the Institute is doing. The, this remark you made there about how cheaper and cheaper and more accessible powerful tech in the hands of people who for whatever reason have a grudge can be very dangerous. That, e that echoes so beautifully what you, Matthew, once, to Matt, once told me was the key argument you made when you convinced Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon to ban bioweapons, about cheap, bio cheap weapons. You wanna share that with, with the whole group here? How you persuaded them? Well, it happened completely by accident. Not in the case of Victor Zdanov, who did this by will. In my case, it was accident. I was working for the government in the summer of 1963, and I was given a tour of Fort Detrick. And we came to a big building which had a 10,000 liter fermenter. And I asked my guide, a very nice man, what do we do there? And he said, we make anthrax spores. And I asked him, why do we need that? And he said, it's cheaper than nuclear weapons. It's a strategic weapon that much cheaper. We can save a lot of money. And I took a taxi cab to get back to my office in the State Department. And it dawned on me, wait, we don't want to have 10 cent nuclear weapons. Why would we want to have cheap biological weapons if they're so potentially potent? I got back to my office. My office mate was Freeman Dyson who I had taken my first quantum mechanics for. And he gave me great encouragement, which was very, so I resolved that. I made a protocol, like the way we do in the laboratory. What would be needed to get rid of this program? And the answer was only the president could do it. So what's, how do you get to him? And then you write the details of the protocol. And I spent the next 10 years just following the protocol. But since I was fortunate enough to be at Harvard, and to have an administration that was still affected by Jack Kennedy's presidency from Harvard, I was able to talk to anybody whose door I knocked on. And little by little, everybody came to see, we don't want to pioneer a cheap weapon of mass destruction. We want war to be so expensive that nobody could afford it, but certainly not for everybody to be able to afford it. That's a, that was that's it. That's such a But moving. you can't do that with other problems. This is a very special case. So for those of you who just joined, now you can really understand why Matthew Messelson got the last year's Future of Life Award. And we're so grateful to you. You're a true hero for us all. I want now, to say Jennifer, something about vaccines. It's certainly important to have good vaccines for certain things, but don't forget the vector. We don't have black death anymore. We don't have a vaccination against Pastorella pestis. We just don't have a lot of rats and lice. So it's important to control the rats and the lice and the mosquitoes, et cetera, et cetera. And even the air we breathe in the case of things that are transmitted as aerosols. All of those things can be done by a kind of engineering, but that's not vaccines, although vaccines are important, but a very expensive way to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Now, continuing on this, this theme here about things we might worry about, you, you Jennifer, are you I can't see you anymore. Are you still here? I'm sorry, Jennifer. I had to go, Max. I, I apologize. Oh, OK. OK, great. So this is a uh, so staying on this on, on this theme here of, of how how we can steer this technology towards um, good uses, we um, You've mentioned something we need to worry about a lot, which is the technology getting both very powerful and then um, being very cheap and falling into the wrong hands. Um, and you also, so I'm curious, what concrete things, what concrete advice would you give to any um, political leaders or other, other influential folks about what we can do right now to push things in the, in the right direction? Would you like to have more oversight of what's happening. Every, like every political leader should find him or herself a group of at least two or three good scientists 
to be by their elbow whenever they need them. They should get Bill Fagy to be, for example, whoever is the president 10 years from now should have a small coterie of good scientists who are also good friends who can be called up on the phone at any time. That one step would get a lot accomplished. Wonderful. Since, uh, since Viktor Zdanov cannot be with us today and speak with his, his own voice today, I'm very curious if, for example, you, Michael, have any anecdotes about your father that you, you, you would like to share with us to make it a little bit more personal so we can all help us all get to know him. Uh, well, uh, yes, there, there, there was a lot of uh, anecdotes, uh, but uh, he, I, I should say immediately that, that uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his personal life, he didn't really <clears throat> uh, talk too much about uh, smallpox eradication or um, other kind of accomplishments uh, that uh, he had uh, with us, the family. He, he uh, kind of left it to his, uh, his uh, kind of uh, research. And I mean, he was always involved in, in science, in research, in, in uh, reading papers, writing books and all these things. And basically the only uh, thing that we uh, heard as a family about uh, about his his uh, kind of efforts to to eradicate uh, diseases, fight diseases, and things like that, was when he invited uh, friends and uh, and uh, visitors and colleagues to our house, uh, our uh, apartment, and uh, they were kind of uh, discussing it, and then we as a family could hear. And in this respect, I just uh, remember uh, there was a, a, a visit from the American uh, uh, delegation and it included a lot of uh, famous uh, scientists. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, Howard Thurman was, was there uh, at that time and uh, uh, a lot of other uh, kind of people I didn't know. Uh, I only heard of them later on when I <laughs> developed as a, as a, in, a researcher. So, uh, and they were uh, kind of uh, talking about um, viruses and, uh, and uh, basically, and at that time, I, I just remember that uh, they were discussing uh, the, the, uh, how the viruses can can become a part of, of uh, a human uh, kind of body. And it was obvious for retroviruses, of course, but, but uh, Victor was very uh, kind of interested in, in, uh, in uh, he was kind of proposing this idea that this can, can happen with other viruses as well, that they can become part of, of, um, of uh, the, uh, human uh, <clears throat> cells and uh, affect our uh, kind of immunity and other things. And I believe that that's uh, a very interesting idea that never was fully developed. And I believe that now people come to, to kind of think about that more and more. Thank you so much for sharing that. And speaking of anecdotes, um, <laughs> Bill, <laughs> Do you want to share with with our listeners here also the the story about that amazing dinner, which I thought really drove home and the, all the the richness of of the international U.S. Soviet collaboration? Yes, thank you, Max. Um, Victor came for a week to visit us at CDC along with uh, Dr. Benediktov, and the two of them spent the entire week going program by program at CDC. They found it so interesting, always asking questions, taking notes. On the last night in Atlanta, we put out a dinner for them at Stone Mountain and the State Department required the state uh, officers to actually come to Atlanta because these were 
such important visitors, Benedictoff and, and Victor. So they sent two people from the State Department. They sent down the Surgeon General, Julius Richmond. And uh, so we had a nice dinner. After dinner, I got up and I proposed some toasts. The first toast that I proposed was, I would like to toast the Soviet Army. <laughs> and with that, the State Department people absolutely lost all the blood in their face. And they sat there not knowing what's going to happen next. Uh, both uh, Benedictoff and Victor looked uneasy what's coming next. And the only person that was sanguine was Julius Richmond, the Surgeon General. He didn't know what I was going to say, but he was okay with whatever I said. So I said that I would toast the Soviet Army because the person at the table who was the deputy director at CDC, Bill Watson, had been in a POW camp during the Second World War. And he had watched the destruction of uh, German cities. He was very emotionally involved in this. And then he was liberated by the Soviet army. And I pointed out what this meant to the health of Americans, what it meant to the health of people in the world. And everybody breathed a sigh of relief. And I remember Benedictoff then getting up and saying, I couldn't make a toast like that without you having done it first. <laughs> but he said, now I'm going to tell you what I would tell Pravda. And uh, so he then told a similar story, but it was a very nice night. And it, it, it was actually a demonstration of what happened in this program with Soviets and Americans working side by side and in India, I actually supervised Soviets who in turn supervised Americans. Now you can't imagine that happening during the Cold War in other, any other program, but it shows what's possible in health. And it says to me, we should figure out how to exploit this, how to use health problems as surrogates for an alien invasion that it just, we all have to be involved in finding the solutions. <laughs> Thank you for that. Now we know that uh, you, Bill, have not only a very big brain and a very big heart, but also a very equally big sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, it's so great to hear you talk about international collaboration that is best here today, because looking here in the chat, we have people listening right now from China, from Russia, from Romania, the UK, Sweden, Canada, Norway, Austria, Italy, New Zealand, and as far away, and Azerbaijan and other places. So hopefully this is also something we can learn from again. If it could be done then, it can probably be done again. And Bill, we have another question here directly from our live audience, which is specifically directed at you. They're wondering, how did you get into smallpox in the first place? <laughs> well, the, uh, I was with the Epidemic Intelligence Service at CDC, and I was stationed in Denver, Colorado. I got a call one noon saying that there was a suspected case of smallpox in a child in the Navajo Nation in New Mexico, and that they'd already made a reservation on a plane for me to fly there that evening, and they suggested I get a book written by Dixon on smallpox. So I went to the medical library, found out it was checked out to a medical student who was writing a paper on smallpox. I was able to find him and he did not want to give up the book because he was writing a paper. And it took some real political persuasion to get that book out of his hands. But I quickly went through the relevant parts of it so that I felt I knew the difference between chickenpox and smallpox anyway, not on that plane. And I was totally uh, surprised to find that there was a car that drove right to the plane as it stopped before we got to the terminal. And they had me get off as they took me to the hospital. And then I found that there were people waiting at the hospital for the quotes outside expert on smallpox to examine the child. And as I entered that room, 
I knew from the door before I ever got to the bedside that I had no idea what that child had. And it turned out to be a very confusing situation of a child recovering from measles and then having disseminated herpes on top of that. And then to make it worse, it's one of only two errors that I have known about in smallpox lab work at CDC, where they originally diagnosed it as compatible with smallpox. So we went through some difficult days, but it, it piqued my interest. And the next year I went to India as part of a CDC project and saw smallpox for the first time. And I was impressed with what a terrible disease this is as I saw even the workers at the hospital were reluctant to touch the patient. And you realized how those patients felt now alienated from the world. So that even if they recovered and they had pockmarks, that's the feeling they were going to have is that they were alienated from the world. So it turned out to be an emotional thing with me of being interested in smallpox because of that first case. Eventually, I, I read in your book also, though, you got so good at diagnosing smallpox at a glance that you couldn't even help yourself from look, by seeing people's pockmarks as you walked through the streets of India and other places. And, and there was a very emotional thing you mentioned there about how that evolved over the years. Do you want to share that? Well, over the years, I came to realize you could actually smell smallpox before you entered the room. And so if I would be starting now with smallpox eradication, one of the first things I would do is train dogs because they would be able to pick this up much faster than humans. If I would be starting now on smallpox eradication, I probably wouldn't be because as Michael knows that with HIV, it changed everything. We actually eradicated smallpox during a window of opportunity and if we had waited until HIV came along, we would have had immune problems that would have made it difficult to do the kind of vaccination programs we did. Fantastic. So we're soon going to give our guests of honor here the last word. Let me say something in closing. Before we do that though, I, I want to, um, this is a very bad habit that professors have can't help assigning homework. This is homework for all of you out there listening to this. Uh, your homework, the way you can contribute, is by letting us know who should get the Future Life Award in the future. Don't worry if you're not completely sure. We take all the nominations and subject them to very careful scientific scrutiny and so on. But if, if you nominate next year's winner, you know, we will give you $3,000 just as a token of, of appreciation. And the uh, and if you tell someone else about this and then they nominate the winner, we'll give them, we'll give you 1,500 and them 3,000. So we want to really crowdsource and get all the good ideas because some of the greatest heroes out there, I believe are so unsung that almost nobody has heard about them. Um, I also want to, before we give you all the last word here, say some word of thanks. First of all, again, to Jan Tallinn, friend and co-founder of the Future Life Institute, and also the very generous guy, thanks to whom we're actually able to give you prize money. Thank you, Jan. You're amazing. And I also want to thank the amazing team here at the Future Life Institute, who has worked very hard for a very long time to, to make all this possible. Beaming love and appreciation at you all. And now... And for, finally, for the rest of you who are listening to this, if you would like to hear a little bit more or learn a bit more about our great heroes, please go to futurelife.org and go to the page about this award. You will find there a fascinating podcast that Lucas Perry has recorded where you, with really interesting interviews with all of the winners here today. You will find this uh, never previously existing in English book about Viktor Zhdanov. You'll find links to Bill's amazing book and so on. This is a journey that can continue for a long time. But for now, let me uh, turn to, first of all, um, Viktor Zhdanov Jr. Do you want to say a few words?
Just a couple words uh, regarding this reward. Well, um, I'm really proud. Um, want to say to how much I'm proud to get this award for my father. And unfortunately, I was very young at the time. My father was working on this smallpox eradication and often he had no time even for me and for my brother. But now I understand that it was to save millions of lives. And I want to say thank you very much. And I'm very proud to take this award for my father. And thank you again. And thank you. Thank you for continuing the legacy there. And um, Michael, do you want to say a few words? Yes, I want to join uh, my brother and uh, thank the Future of Life Institute, uh, and uh, especially uh, for your uh, kind of uh, recognition of uh, Viktor Rodanov's uh, lifelong efforts to engage international cooperation in fighting world diseases. And I think that that's the key point to our future uh, success in uh, fighting infections. Thank you so much. And uh, Bill, you're going to get the last word for this live stream. Uh, thank you, Max. First, uh, to have a professor assign homework uh, reminds me that when I gave a commencement address at a college once, I said, why do we have commencement addresses? Because the passion to teach surpasses the passion to learn. And so teachers will give you homework right till the end. But let me say that um, I, I'm so pleased with this award, but I'm particularly pleased that you've made it international, made the point that this was international and that it was possible because of a problem that politics could not interfere with. So even in the Cold War, we had the Soviets and the Americans working together it becomes a great example of how we should do things in the future. Thank you so much. What a great way to summarize what this is all about. Thank you so much, all of you. Huge congratulations to our winners. And I hope all of you who are listening feel inspired by this and go out and do great things to make a, a great future of life. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>